I should have shared my screen. So let me first begin Dhamma family by thanking all of you who have um, been faithfully following our series. And now, can I check with Sister Yen Lee? Are you able to see my screen? Yes, Dr. Puna. All right, wonderful. Sister Yen Lee, you will have noticed is beautifully made up today with a team that we wanted her to have. And that is, we wanted her to have a golf team. And some of you may realize this is from the show, The Adams Family, showing an adult Wednesday Adam. And Sister Yen Lee looks remarkably close to this adult Wednesday Adam. Now, the reason I pointed this out is that different cultures have different beliefs, different viewpoints, different perspective of how somebody would look like if they are, for example, around us, not around us, or if they are backed to us. So the first thing we have to realize is that our culture and our tradition have a tremendous influence with regards to our viewpoints on how they will behave, how they will look like. And most of the us soliciting in here today are Chinese, I assume. And we too have our own interpretations and our own cultural perspective. Now, this is the seventh lunar month. And from small until now, I am sure most of us, by and large, will have been fed a diet akin to this by our well-meaning seniors. And many of us are familiar. For example, you should not bring an umbrella into your house at night, especially to never poking your toaster chopstick in your rice, etc., etc. Now, today's sharing is really trying to answer many questions which I have received over the last few days. Which of this is culture? Which of this is Buddhism? Which of this is taught by the Buddha? Which of it is logical? And which of it is not applicable? So tonight's sharing is going to be slightly longer than usual longer than the usual where I stop at 9.30 for the very simple reason that I am incorporating most of the questions into the sharing itself. And as Sister Yen Li very wisely pointed out just now, sometimes some of the things really border onto the ridiculous. And anyone with common sense, for example, would realize that this is a bit ridiculous. And as Sister Yinling would tell me, beings in many other realms do not have a body. They do not have the physical body that you and I have. So an injection like this could really be quite meaningless to them because they do not have a physical body. And my cousin from America wrote to me and asked me which brand. So I told them one is Pfizer, one is AstraZeneca, and one is Sinovac. Powder Liao sure will have his uh, antibody production because the man has made sure all the three are well incorporated. So this, of course, we can see borders on the ridiculous. And certainly this has nothing to do with what the Buddha taught. The Buddha insisted that we use our intellect, use our common sense, use our wisdom whenever we walk this path and practice the Dhamma. But being silly like that is not limited to us. Stupidity is really a universal trait. And you have this, for example, which I found on the internet. And so, you know, people are doing ridiculous things to prove a point. And of course, many will pay a very high price. So remember what the Buddha taught is that we do not have original sin, but we certainly have original stupidity. Almost all of us have original stupidity in various forms. So let us begin right away with the seventh lunar month, being 
either Chinese or Korean or Japanese or Taiwanese, or most people in East Asia, the oriental part of it, that is, um, the seventh lunar month is a very important month because of the influence of three things. One, the influence of Confucianism, the influence of Taoism, and then the influence of Buddhism. And because Buddhism is such an accommodating religion under inverted commas, you will see that all three aspects of this three big philosophical traditions have become engrossed into one, so much so that many people cannot even tell apart which is which. So tonight I'm trying to share, trying to share with all of us what the Buddha taught, the important aspects and what is cultural. And I'll begin with something which we will see all around the roadside. Tomorrow is the 14th day of the seventh month and I'm Cantonese. The Cantonese offer on the 14th day of the seventh month. Other dialects group may offer on the 15th day. So let's begin with these offerings from a venerable, a Mahayana venerable no less, and see what is tradition, what is culture, and what is pure business. For seven months, they, they, they do all the offerings along the side of the pathway and things like that. So if people were to remove this and then they'll have bad karma or they'll fall sick or the, the ghost will come and haunt them, then, then the first person to die will be our essential cleaners, uh, right? They, they'll be the first one to, <laughs> to get it from the spirits. Uh, so essentially, no. Uh. Once offering is done, you can just clear the offering. Hello everybody, welcome to Ti Zhang Lin. So people usually call me uh, Venerable Yo Wei. I'm the abbot of Ti Zhang Lin and I'm also sitting on the board of the Singapore Buddhist Federation. There are many different varieties of Buddhists. So for the Mahayana Buddhists, which are essentially the more Chinese Buddhists, they get this burning culture through the Chinese uh, culture. So in ancient China, what we know is that the first burning instance dates back to like the northern or the southern dynasties. And that's the time where the Royalties, in order to protect their uh, imperial tomb, they put money offerings in the tombs. This is to ward off also tomb raiders la, who are coming for, for jewellery. In ancient China, uh, whatever the royalty will do, uh, the commoners will follow. There was another very interesting uh, story about a scholar who is selling paper. So in order to make paper sell, he came up with this idea of you know offering paper money to uh, the deceased because the deceased cannot, cannot come and dispute that I don't need this money. So that's how it comes about. Essentially burning uh, paper money is more a Chinese kind of culture. So it's, it's not inherently uh, Buddhist, uh, neither is it inherently Taoist. The only two things which we burn are incense and probably candles in the form, uh, as a light offering. People like to think that when they offer more things, they get more merits or they get more return. But now we know, uh, the more we burn actually, the more bad things we get. We get more fumes, <laughs> we destroy more part of the earth. So yeah, so uh, that's the tricky part of it. That being said, I think um, then there are people who, are, who depends on this la, for a livelihood. People who, who, who sells uh, incense, who sell joss paper. For everybody's sanity or for the consolation of most Chinese as well, if they want to burn, sure, do the burning in moderation. Now. I would also advise that more people tune towards the more doing good rather than burning things. Sincerity is more important than uh, whatever we burn. All right, Dhamma family, this is very important. Here, Venerable has explained to us quite clearly that these practices have nothing to do with what the Buddha taught. And these practices are really our Chinese culture. And of course, the Chinese culture is what makes us Chinese. So in many ways, while we learn the Dhamma, while many ways we learn what is good, what is true, also, we should not completely abandon our own culture and traditions. For example, many among us will still have elderly relatives. Sister Yen Li, I am sure, will have many elderly relatives, some of whom 
are alive and some of them would have passed away. And if a grandmother, for example, would feel happy that Sister Yen Li do offer some burning of paper money, et cetera, et cetera, because it's a consolation to the elder generation. And we don't want them to say, oh, you see, uh, this Yen Li, la, she share four, la, share four already now. Uh, the one grandmother, la, the one grandfather, la, everything say the one, la, the Hyang Lo also throw away. La. So please, we do not want. And it is just a gesture of respect. And as the Venerable himself said, if you wish to burn, well, just do it in moderation. But one must realize this has nothing to do with the Buddha Dharma. The Buddha certainly did not teach anything like that. This is almost completely Chinese culture. And Zhongyuan has been a cultural practice in China for a long, long time, way before the major religions and philosophies came in. And here we looked at it as respect for our seniors, respect for those who have passed away, and respect and trying to help those who have passed on with no dependents, no children, no relatives. And I will talk more about that. You will also have noticed the Venerable mentioned it is more important to do good deeds and ask your relatives who have passed on to rejoice in your good deeds. Because when you do good deeds and they rejoice in your good deeds, they actually are generating their own merits. When we do good deeds and we dedicate these good deeds to your departed relatives or to all the pietas that are on the street, the ones that have no family to offer, no one to do anything for them, we say, yeah, we will want to offer for them. Now, these people need our offering or our dedication of merits. And when one dedicate merits, inviting them to partake and they rejoice, they generate their own merits, which in many ways will actually help them. So that is a practice which the Buddha taught. So that is a practice which is important. And here I want to show you a teaching from the Theravada aspect with regards to this sharing or dedication of merits to the departed. Just give me a second. Dhanajan Jandi uh, asked me to say a few words uh, because this is the Qingming period. This is a time when traditionally we make uh, offerings and do acts of kindness and generosity to re uh, remember our ancestors, our relatives, friends and companions uh, who have uh, been a part of our lives both in this life and also in the past because uh, the Buddha said that uh, beings have association, have contact, meet each other because of past lives, past associations. And we haven't just met each other uh, you know, in this occasion, uh, but there has been contact from the past and that brings us together. And so one of the duties of uh, the living is to remember with gratitude those who have passed away. And when we remember with gratitude, then one of the duties the Buddha said of a son or a daughter is to make offerings to their mother, their father, their relatives and friends once they've passed away. So this tradition is actually from the words of the Buddha. This is one of our duties because he said that our acts of generosity, when we intend to share the good merit that's obtained from that act of generosity, that wholesome intention, if other beings, if they're born in a realm which they can receive that, then they rejoice that we've remembered them, we, they rejoice that we've done an act of generosity in their name, and that rejoicing makes their mind wholesome. When the mind is wholesome, then that creates good karma, and that good karma then uh, can lead to their rebirth in a better realm or in a, even a, a more blissful realm or at least bring them happiness in that realm. So because beings are born in, in many realms, uh, both in the heaven realms and the realms of suffering, the way the, the beings are experiencing unpleasant 
are results of their actions, then if we do acts of kindness to them, uh, then we can help them out. Uh, I once asked one of very senior uh, bhikkhu who went to America. And I asked him when he came back because I knew he has many skills in this area. I said, is there many ghosts in the US? And he said, yes, a lot. And I asked him, well, why? And he said, because of two reasons. First, firstly, the belief in one life, the Christian idea of one life, it leads to very strong attachment. Now it's not necessarily Christian, but it's you know the, a worldly view that there is only this existence. We come out of nothing, well, then we'll die into nothing, or we come out of nothing, we're going to go. This is our only existence in the human realm. Then that leads to very strong attachment to one's uh, physical possessions, one's house, one's home, and one's relatives. And therefore the unwillingness to let go when one passes away. So then they're reborn through that attachment with association to that people, those places, those situations. That's the first thing. And the second thing which he said is very important is there's no tradition in the West of sharing merit. So if a person is born in a realm of unhappiness, then none of their relatives ever do acts of generosity in their name. And therefore they can't rejoice and therefore because of their situation they don't have the opportunity to uh, do acts of generosity uh, in the same way we do. Therefore they can't receive merit. And so he said wherever he went he made sure the people offered Sangha Dana and shared the merit with the deceased. And uh, that helps him. And many people wonder, is it you know, actually possible to share merit? And I give the analogy, as you know, many of you maybe have children who have studied overseas. Yes, you have children studying in Australia or in England or the US. And supposing it's your birthday today and your sons who are in Melbourne or sons who are in the US or in England, uh, thinking of mum and thinking of dad and thinking, oh, it's their birthday today. They've been such wonderful parents. I have so much gratitude for everything they've done and they've sent me to be educated overseas here. Um, I will go out and do uh, an act, give some money to a charity that my mother likes or my father uh, encourages, give, give something, do something good to an old person or help somebody today out of worshipping the goodness in my mother or father. Okay, you're here in Malaysia, haven't done anything. They're over in overseas in a different continent and they go and do an act of generosity, or even go to a monastery and offer dana in your name. And then in the evening they ring up and say, hello mum, hello dad, uh, you know, I love you very much and you know, happy birthday. I'm so grateful for you that I know you're such a kind and good person. Uh, I've gone and offered to a charity today to appreciate and out of respect for the goodness you've taught me, the virtues you've instilled in me. Then I've carried on that act of kindness and generosity in your name today. Would that make you happy as a parent? I think yes. And you haven't done anything. But just to hear that somebody else who is a relative, a friend, has done something out of gratitude and appreciation of the goodness you've taught them and instilled in them, and they're carrying that on in your name and doing something good, that would make you feel very content as a parent that I've instilled good qualities in my son and daughter. And that goodness sometimes would carry on much longer a sense of gratification that they've done that in your name, even more so than if they said, oh, mum, I bought you a birthday cake or a birthday card today. Uh, it's sometimes much more deeper and profound. Uh, and so you haven't done anything, but you have been informed they have done the goodness out of respect for you. That is a mental thing. You've received that information. So too, if you do an act of goodness today, like here we have just offered this Sangha Dana, if you make a mental uh, 
determination. I share this with my mother, my father, my relatives, my friends. And you say their name in your mind as the monks are chanting. That is like the phone call, yes? Yeah. The phone call, the power of the mind is incredibly powerful. It can transgress beyond boundaries of realms, from one realm to another. The power of a concentrated mind is very strong. And by informing your relatives and friends, you may not know where they have been born, but they can be sensitive. In certain realms, they can pick that up, just like a phone call. If you've got a charged battery on your phone, if your battery's not charged, it won't go. If you've paid your bills, it will go. You're making that connection. Someone receives it. They inform that, that can bring great delight and happiness to them from a long time. So beings in other realms, if you're concentrating your mind and informing them, may my mother, my father, both in this life and all my mothers and fathers of every lifetime I've had in the realm of samsara, I offer the, share the merits that I've made today with all those beings because they have brought me to this point in life where I've learnt the Dhamma, learnt the Buddha's teachings. I have gratitude and appreciation for you all and I'm offering this gift for you. This is something that is fulfilling our duties that the Buddha said we had to the departed. So brothers and sisters, this is pretty clear and what the Buddha taught with regards to us, we have a duty to honour our parents, we have a duty in the Sikala Wada to honour them even after they passed away as taught to us in the Sikala Wada Sutta. So we have to make offerings and as is clearly stated, not just making offerings, we have to do good deeds and these good deeds to be dedicated to them and then they rejoice exactly as the Venerable had described. And certainly if I am gone and my children are to do something like that, I will be so happy that first they are good people and second, they remember the old man and third, they actually do make a dedication and I will be extremely happy. Okay, so this is how the, the first Venerable explained it would be better that you do good deeds rather than you just burn, burn, burn because of our culture. Now, there is another thing that the Venerable pointed out, which is very important. He mentioned about America. He mentioned about people with strong attachment. And then because of their very strong attachment, you will become a ghost. Because the ghostly realm is the only realm whereby you can actually come back and see Yan Li, Wei Li, come and see Bapa Ju saying, while the other realms you are unable to. So with strong attachment, many people become or recycle into that realm because that's the only realm in which they can still hang around. So now I learned this from a forest venerable some years ago when he used to come and help us with, for example, the offerings to and dedication of marriage to these unseen beings. And he explains to us the concept of what we call hao xiong di. You will see again in Chinese culture, whether in Hong Kong, Taiwan, I don't know about China now, but I received questions from Hong Kong and Taiwan with regards to the concept of hao xiong di. Now, in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and the overseas Chinese, this forest Ajahn explained to us, and he has psychic powers, he can see them, um, that it goes even one layer deeper. And this is what actually I wrote in a short article and then a second longer article, maybe about six or seven years ago. And the short article went viral. It went around the world. It came back to me from Germany, from America, from all parts of the world. I wish the long article had gone viral, but it's the short one. The short one doesn't explain it so fully. But here he explains to us that the overseas Chinese, like most of us here now listening in, we descended from people who came from China. In the 19th century, the 1800s, early 1900s, they came to Malaya, to Borneo, to Indonesia, to Singapore, and they had very, very hard lives. Please remember, 50% of them will die from malaria, from beriberi, from all kinds of tropical illnesses, a lot from starvation and malnutrition. 
Now, the first generation of people who came were all males. Ladies do not come. So many of you will have great-grandparents, for example, who came from China. Your great-grandfather will have settled here. He may have married a wife here, or he may even have another one more wife back in China. That's not uncommon. And sometimes they will go back to China later on and bring the whole family over. Now, that's for those who successfully survived. Many fail to survive. And so while they are working in the tin mines or clearing the jungles in Cebu to plant pepper and gambia, many of these young or middle-aged men would have died. And when they died, all their friends could do is to dig a hole and bury them and make some simple offerings. Clan associations, Hong Tong Yisan, all kinds of associations crop up, which you still see the remnants of all over Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia today. And these clan associations literally help to bury their own clansmen to support them. Now, these clansmen, including your ancestors and my ancestors who survived, they promise to take care of each other. And if A dies, B will bury and B will make offerings. And if B dies later on, B's descendants would make offerings. Now, these who died here, nameless, buried somewhere, don't even know where their graves are, in such discomfort, such agony, and such worry about their family, many of them will be hungry ghosts or pietas because of the very strong attachment. But they've got no family, nobody here to make offerings, to do good deeds, to share merits with them or dedicate merits to them. And so in Chinese, these are literally called Hu Wan Ye Guai, who nobody knows. And so what is done for the descendants is that they offer at the roadside to this Hao Xiong Ti, the Hao Xiong Ti of your forefathers. And that's why they offer at the roadside, not to their own ancestors, but to any one of these poor ghost theaters with no descendant, nobody, and make dedication or marriage to them, hoping that they will rejoice and have a rebirth. So that adds another layer on top of the Zhong Yun Chi that is celebrated in China, in Taiwan, Hong Kong. They too have that festival for a long, long time. So here we have another layer. Now the same venerable when he was in Singapore, the Singapore brothers brought him to the beach facing Santosa. When he was aired there, he said that there are lots of theaters around because that was where the Japanese used to shoot or the Chinese that they caught. They were just shot dead at the beaches. And well, it's exactly like what the Venerable shared in the video just now. These people who died nameless, faceless, no family members, nothing. Who is going to dedicate marriage to them? It is now on us, the owners on us, to do what we can. And it is much, much better to actually do good, wholesome deeds and dedicate it to them, invite them to partake, to share, to rejoice, than just burning paper offerings or paper clothes. So, as I said right from the word go, the concept of how the goals would look like varies from culture to culture. In a Western culture, they will look something like a ghostly figure of Morticia Adam or Wednesday Adam, which Sister Yen Li, we instructed her to mimic. Or if you look from the Chinese view, viral on <laughs> Now, I, I must say that the person who did this is quite ingenious because it gave a whole lot of publicity to vaccination. But as I said, if you follow what is taught to us quite strictly, it also borders on the ridiculous because a ghost does not have a physical body and a vaccination would not be possible. Now, the other important thing which the Venerable in the video mentioned just now is that the concept of one life versus the concept of you and I being recycled endlessly. Now, if the concept is of one life, then people tend to be very, very attached. Now, if the concept is you and I are going to be recycled endlessly and you have clear insight into it, then you know that death is just a door and so is birth. It's just a door. And I want you to listen to what Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh 
teaches us with regards to this. And this is a very important teaching. When you look at uh, a cloud, uh, you think that the cloud as a being. And later on, when the cloud becomes the rain, you don't see the cloud anymore. And you say the cloud the, is not there. And you, de you describe the cloud as non-being. But uh, if you look deeply, you can see the cloud in the rain. Uh, and that is why uh, it's impossible for a cloud to die. A cloud can become uh, rain or snow or ice, but a cloud cannot become nothing. And that is why the notion of death cannot be applied to reality. There is a, a transformation. There is a continuation. But you cannot say that there is death. Because in your mind, to die means from something, you suddenly become nothing. Uh, from someone, you suddenly become no one. And so the notion of death cannot apply to reality, whether to a cloud or to a human being. Uh, the Buddha did not die. The Buddha only continued uh, by his Sangha, by his Dharma. And you can touch the Buddha in the here and the now. And that is why ideas like uh, uh, being born, uh, dying, coming and going, uh, being and non-being uh, should be removed by, by the practice of looking deeply. And when you can remove these notions, uh, you are free and you have non-fear. So this is very important. Please know that you are recycled. Now, even your present body, Sister Yen Li, is recycled from something. The atoms in your arm, the carbon atoms that form the bulk of you came from some star that died a billion years ago, exploded, sending its organic material all over the universe. The nitrogen atoms in you again came from another star. So you're literally stardust. You're literally recycled from so many things. And when you so-called die, you too will be recycled, just as Venerable explained. A cloud does not die. A cloud becomes recycled. You learn from physics that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It is merely transformed. So we are merely transformed into all kinds of states. And of course, the transformation into a spirit, a ghostly state is another one of that transformation. And I think that for those of us who are students of the Buddha Dharma, when you understand this, you really lose your fear. Instead, we should not look at death as something frightening, but look at death as just another door and something that we can actually utilize in our daily life to make ourselves better. Let us look, take a look at this and see what death can actually teach us. Now, please remember Dhamma family. If there is one thing for sure in this life, it is not who is going to be the 9th, 10th or 11th Prime Minister of Malaysia. It is that death is certain for every one of us. Life and death are a package deal. You can't pull them apart. We cannot be truly alive without maintaining an awareness of death. Death is not waiting for us at the end of a long road. Death is always with us in the marrow of every passing moment. She's the secret teacher hiding in plain sight. She helps us to discover what matters most. And the good news is we don't have to wait until the end of our lives to realize the wisdom death has to offer. Over the past 30 years, I've sat on the precipice of death with a few thousand people. Some of them came to their deaths full of disappointment. Others blossomed and stepped through that door full of wonder. What made the difference was the willingness to gradually live into the deeper dimensions of what it means to be human. All of them were my teachers. These people invited me in to the most vulnerable moments of their lives. And they made it possible for me to get up close and personal with death. And in the process, they taught me how to live. Now, 
Now the Buddha taught us that we must recollect the fact that we will die every day. When we recollect the fact that we will die every day of our life, then we will live our lives fully, meaningfully, and not do ridiculous things. Live every day mindfully in the present moment, fully when you know that death is an inevitable fact of life. And when we get into an argument with an ex co, with a committee, with whatever, just ask yourself, if I'm going to be dead in six months, will this be important? Ask yourself that honest question. How many of us here can be sure we are going to be alive seven months from now? None of us, especially with COVID-19 pandemic. Every day, we see death straight in the face. Every day, you report how many people have died. You see it in the news, in the Facebook, WhatsApp. Brothers and sisters in the Dharma, do you realize that the number of people who die in Malaysia every day from COVID is the equivalent of a plane crashing in Malaysia full of passengers every single day. Are you aware of that? When you are aware of that, when you realize this fact of life, then we will live our lives more fully. And that's what the Buddha wanted us to be awake, to live our lives, to be in the moment. And I think this mindfulness of death is really something very important because it really makes us live in this moment. Let us listen to His Holiness the Dalai Lama teach us a little bit about death and how we should approach it. Death, illness, old age, part of our life, it comes. Now better to look death, part of our life, sooner or later it will come. Now important is while we are alive, our deadliest life should be meaningful. Meaningful means, if possible, help others. Uh, if not, at least reach and harming others. That's a meaningful life. Okay. And then at the end come, you will not have any uh, regret. I carry my life honestly, truthfully, more compassionately, and I done something good for others. Then at the end of come, you feel happy. Then according to religious tradition, if there is God, uh, God will look after you. If no God, uh, see, we are self, self, self-creation. Because of the self-creation. So you done meaningful life. So that's guarantee your next life will be happy, nice life. Mm-hmm. So that's the non-theistic religious tradition. There's no creator but oneself as a creator. So goes one's own, like the later part of our life, much depends on early part of your life, study, uh, and including sort of exercise, and then the result, uh, good result come later part of your life. Similarly, this life, we carry meaningful life, uh, helping other. This life utilized for something good for other, more compassionate way. Then, you see, that's effect next life. So, so, so therefore, the death is something like change of clothes. <laughs> clothes become dirty, <laughs> or old. Then time comes to change. Similarly, this body uh, becomes too old or too old. Then time comes to change. Okay, so look that that way. Otherwise, you see, that is something mystery and dark. So you may get feeling of as well, too much anxiety, fear like that. But if you 
if you know about the death. And I think uh, either theistic religion believe God or non theistic religion believe yourself. You, you carry your life in a meaningful way, then there's a guarantee. So at the end, no regret. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, such a beautiful teaching? If we can all apply this beautiful teaching by His Holiness in our life, and we've got nothing to fear. I think this is one of the most beautiful teachings with regards to death that I am aware of in a short video clip. Now, some of us who were earlier here, we all took the precepts. We all took the five precepts. Some of us will be very earnest and honest in my wanting to keep the precepts. Some of us may not be so honest, you know. Uh, we just mouth the precept, then the instant this is over, we go back to our whole lives. So take a look at this video. Better keep your precepts very well. Because, you know, you are creating. You are the creator. You are creating your future. And, uh, well, you may have done a lot of dana, but if you don't keep your precepts well, 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 this is a nice lesson here to teach us. Let us make sure we not only do dana, which is a wholesome thing, but let us also keep our precepts well. So coming back to the seventh month, is it that ghosts only come in the seventh month? Well, oh, that's very cultural in our Chinese Confucian, Taoist, and Champo Champo inside Buddhist teachings, we have this belief that it is seventh month. But in reality, actually ghosts are around at all times of the year. Different cultures will have different ones. Uh, Venerable Ajahn told us in Thailand, October, Filipino brothers and sisters tell me their Halloween is another time, etc., etc. Chinese culture, seven months. But here, another venerable raised a point. He said, don't forget, we are the creators of ourselves. So if you keep insisting, believing, fixing in your mind that it's only in the seventh month, then there is a good chance that you have created that mind state. As a doctor, I see death all the time. When I was working in hospital, every day people die. So there are plenty of ghosts around, but most of them are harmless. They don't do for me, I don't do for So brothers and sisters, let's try our very best not to stay in a hospital. So make sure you get your COVID-19 vaccine. It's so important. Okay, very, very important. And this short video clip has illustrated it very, very well. And I think that it is also very important for us to realize, dear Dhamma family, that while death is certain, it's only uncertainty. It's the time. And so you might think, well, I'm very healthy. I'm all right. I've got no diabetes, no hypertension, no heart disease, you know. But remember, anicca, impermanence or instability, dukkha, unreliability, and anatta, non-self. We have no control. There are so many things. None of us three years ago would have imagined COVID-19. But back to down to earth, very, very down to earth, there are also many, many other things which are beyond our control. Take a look at this, brothers and sisters. All right, you can just be minding your own business, driving on the road and something like that 
disastrously can happen. So this is what the Buddha taught us as a nietzsche, dukkha, anatta. So let us do good deeds, dana, whatever good we can do, let's do it. Let us keep our precepts as far as possible, sila, and let us bhavana, train our mind. Even learning the dhamma is bhavana. And realize that what the Buddha taught us with regards to these realities of anicca, dukkha, anatta is very, very real. Let us realize that we do not know when we may be living. Let us realize that we have to live the moment well. And here I want to show you a very nice Chan teaching to help you learn a little bit more. 你怎麼會跟我開這麼多玩笑呢? 這些才是真正的興旺啊,你說對不對?又對不對?生為療益,死為休息,死。So this I hope you all can understand, it is in China, in Cantonese. It's a rich man moving into a new house and he invited an eminent venerable, a Chan master to write a Chinese calligraphic scroll to bless his house. And so the Chan master wrote Father die, son die, grandchild die. And of course, he was very, very upset. He said, I ask you to bless me, you are cursing me. And the Chan master, who sees reality, who sees way beyond what you and I see, and that's why many of them appear to be a bit awed by unenlightened people. So what he has written is, father die, son die, grandchild die. And when the man is shocked and say, why are you cursing me? He said, no, this is the highest bliss. If in your family, every generation follows this sequence, the old pass away first. And then only after the next generation, then only after the next generation, you will have much less pain, suffering, grief. If ever this sequence is upset, unimaginable grief and pain will come to your family. He said, if you understand this, then you understand death is not something to be feared. It is the wrong thinking, bad timing that will make us really suffer. So I hope that you understand this very profound teaching. And here you got one silly fella trying to teach you how to die well. Let's hope you can see this. death whereby a person dies in relative comfort without pain without secretions troubling him such that he can die mindfully peacefully with the mind in a state that is wholesome recalling good deeds recalling wholesome acts and if possible meditating that is living in that present moment and good death is a death that encompasses not just that but also a death with dignity, i.e. a death that is natural without all sorts of tubes and needles being inserted in the body and a death without regrets 
which would mean that the person is able to pass on without feeling guilty or fear of things done or things not done that is said things not said things that should have been done but undone or things that should not have been done but done so all these things would require that we actually start preparing for it now and not at the moment of death because the time of death is really unpredictable as to the first part death without pain medicine in the 21st century is able to provide most people with relatively comfortable deaths death is an event the dying process is a process and we want to make that dying process as smooth as comfortable such that the patient himself and his attending family members are not distressed or rather minimally distressed if we can achieve that as for the second part of death with doubt regrets that is something we need to start doing now living a good life living a life that is meaningful meaning a life of significance rather than a life of materialism in the end what really matters is not what we label ourselves as whatever tradition or religion but what we have done with our lives and if we have lived a good life then that is a good life that has been led and like someone who has worked well in the day he deserves a good night's sleep that would be just a door to another one more state of existence all right okay i hope that sharing would have helped us a little bit more in understanding and now let us go on and realize that as our malaysian population ages as immigration for example takes place among the young realize that many of us will be alone realize that many of us will be husband and wife with children everywhere except home and realize that many people whose spouse have passed on will be living alone so kalyana meters become extremely important in the 21st century already in countries like japan korea we are seeing a huge problem of elderly people living by themselves sometimes the spouse having gone and they could have died for days or even weeks without anybody realizing so within our little community kayana meters will be very important to provide support to each other whatsapp each other every morning if you do not receive a whatsapp from this person call him make sure he's all right etc because we need to support each other and if we do not support each other then who is going to support us the government isn't going to support us so it's right what the chinese say kaki kuki ki ya so we as a community the buddha had already told us kayana meters is the entire spiritual life we have to encourage each other support each other and provide strength to each other when we ourselves are not well there is actually much much more that i would be able to share but it's already 9:30 now and i would just go on to answer some of the questions that were posted to me and now one of the questions which was asked of me is with regards to this called ulambama okay ulambama ulambama is a sanskrit word because the one who asked the question was confused you've got the hungry ghost festival you've got chung yin ji you've got uh mulian saving the mother and then you've got ulambama and so what do all these mean well they are all words of course now the ulambama in sanskrit literally means relieving someone or taking someone away from suffering in chinese chao du or chao du you are in pain you are in suffering you are in distress we relieve you now the ulambama sutra is not found in the pali canon the ulambama sutra is only found in the mahayana canon and it tells of the story of how mogalana 
try to help the mother. It is widely believed to be a much later writing and, and that's one reason why it did not appear in the Pali Canon. And it, it is in the Mahayana Canon and it is widely accepted by the Chinese because the concept of filial piety, the concept of serving the parents, the concept of trying your best to honor your parents and do something for them is something which uh, very much is in sync with the Chinese psychic, with Confucianism. And so in many Mahayana countries, um, mostly the Oriental countries, this is celebrated, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, even Tibet. And it is based on the belief that in the seventh month, these theaters or goals will be around. But as I said, actually around all the time, but we are created by ourselves, as one venerable taught me, you create your future. So if you keep on believing in this, you could very well be around in the seventh month. Now in the Ulambama day, or month, sorry, it is we doing lots of dana. And nowadays, of course, dana includes offering food, offering financial help for the needy to special needs schools, special needs homes, especially now in COVID, where they are really seriously affected. Offer them help, offer them the dana of your skill, your time, and then dedicate these merits to these unseen beings. Sister Yen Li, please take note at the end of this, when you dedicate merits, make a point to dedicate merits to the unseen beings, the Hao Xiong Ti, that might be listening to our talk right now, that might be attracted by your makeup today. So the Ulabama festival also celebrated as Ubon in Japanese, also celebrated in Vietnam, Hong Kong, etc. as I said, is a time of doing good deeds and dedicating these good deeds to the departed ones, to the Hao Xiong Ti, to the theaters or hungry ghosts that have no family, nobody, not even known, faceless, nameless. And so it is in fact, are things that are mentioned, these values are mentioned in the Pali Canon as taught by the Buddha. The Buddha clearly told us, dedicate merits to the departed. He clearly told us to honor our relatives, our seniors, and to support them. And even after they have passed on to honor them. And he even taught King Bimbisara how to dedicate merits. So while the Sutra is not found in the Pali Canon, its values are common. And if you go to Thailand, for example, you will see a predominantly Theravada country. They too will celebrate and observe the things that are valuable and to be practiced by us. So let us not look upon it as superstition. Let us look upon it as a month whereby all of us would want to do good deeds and make these good deeds to be in the memory or dedicated to our departed relatives and to all unseen beings or beings who may not have children or relatives or descendants to honor them. So this is something which is important. And so certainly this is not a month of superstition. It is only superstition when you decide to buy three crates of paper money and burn billions of hell notes, certainly that doesn't help. Instead, do good deeds and honor them with that dedication of merits. So it is a month of merit accumulation and then immense opportunities to practice dana generosity. It is also an opportunity for us to remember our ancestors and to remember those haoshongti who came with them to Malaya, Singapore, Borneo, Indonesia, and to honor them, to help them, to, be re to get them to be reborn by giving them the opportunity to rejoice in these merits. Now, another question which is often asked of me, what about the pure land? And I'm not gonna answer that question directly because I don't want to get into trouble. I'm merely quoting here word for word from the 
six patriarch, Hui Neng, the Venerable Hui Neng, the giant of Chan Buddhism, the sixth patriarch of Chan Buddhism, the only Chinese teaching to be called a sutra. You know, the Venerable Hui Neng was the sixth patriarch in the Zen tradition, the Chan tradition, and he was an absolutely brilliant man, though uneducated formally. And in the Platform Sutta, many, many common questions are answered. And in this particular chapter, this man asked him about pure land. This prefect Wei asked him about pure land. And the Venerable got this question. Your disciple, prefect Wei, always see monks and lay people practicing mindfulness of Buddha Amitabha and wishing for rebirth in the Western paradise. See Tiena, Sai Tiena. Please explain this. Are they reborn there or not? Please eliminate my doubts. And Hui Neng's reply, and I will read, seems to show that he thinks that people are misunderstanding this. And he said, the deluded person recites the Buddha's name and seeks for rebirth in that location, which is the Western paradise. While the enlightened person actually purifies his own mind. So please realize this. And he goes on to explain using very strong words, Stupid, ordinary people do not comprehend their self-nature and they do not recognize that the pure land is actually in your mind, inside you, not somewhere external. And he goes on, you can actually access it during your lifetime now. And he said that the pure land is no further away from your heart, it's from you. And any person can access this pure land simply by purifying your mind. Okay, I've already read, read this just now. And he said the Buddha land is pure whenever the mind is pure. And he goes on to explain because the common belief is that the Western pure land is Si Wan Pa Qian Li. Li is not exactly equal to mile, but it's the Chinese equivalent of distance. So the common belief is Si Wan Pa Qian Li to the West. And the Venerable Hui Neng explains it here. Okay, magistrate, etc. The West is not far from here. If you harbor unwholesome thoughts, don't have your dana, don't have your sila, one may recite the Buddha's name, whichever Buddha's name, but it will be difficult to attain any rebirth in that wholesome thing. Good knowing advisors, I now exhort you all to get rid of the 10 evils first, the 10 unwholesome deeds, and you would have walked 100,000 miles. So the si wan pa qian li, si wan is 100,000. Get rid of the 10 evils, the 10 unwholesome deeds, and you will have walked 100,000 miles. Now get rid of the eight deviation. The eight deviation is the opposite of the noble eightfold path. That means instead of right view, right thoughts, etc., you have wrong views or deviated views, deviated thoughts. Okay, right speech, deviated speech. Right action, deviated action. So the eight opposite of the Noble Eightfold Path. If you keep your Noble Eightfold Path and don't go into the opposite, you would have gone 8,000 miles. Si wan pa qian. So in every thought, you see your own nature and always practice impartiality and straightforwardness. straightforwardness. You will arrive in a finger snap in the Western Pure Land, because it is in your mind. Okay, so I think this is very important. It is not si wan pa tian li to the West. It is in your mind. If you get rid of the 10 unwholesome deeds, you have already walked 100,000 li. If you keep the eightfold path, you will have gone the 8,000 li. Can you please understand this? All right, so... Just to remind us, what is the wholesome and unwholesome deeds? I'm so sorry, it's a bit small, but I'm sure most of you are aware, the 10 wholesome deeds, the 10 unwholesome deeds, 
If you keep your precepts, you will be staying away from these 10 unwholesome deeds because these 10 unwholesome deeds are very much related to your precepts. Killing, stealing, misbehaving sexually, then wrong speech in four aspects, telling lies, slander, talk roughly, and then gossiping and frivolous talk. And finally, the mind, the fifth precept, keeping the mind pure. Okay? So the Noble Eightfold Path, all of you are aware. Now I'm going to go on now and show you this. This will be the last thing I will share before I close because it's getting late. But as I said, I have to answer the questions. Yes. So one of the questions is, how do I prepare? Well, please, I can send this PDF to you all. This was a PDF I compiled from the internet many years ago. All right. I would suggest strongly that you fill this in because this tells exactly to your next generation, what do you want when you are about to die? It solves a lot of problems because one of the things we see in people who are terminally ill is wah, near the end, kalam kabut. One child say this, one child say that, the wife is crying away, etc., etc. So I think that as Buddhists who are living mindfully, knowing the inevitability of death, you should fill this and don't give it to your husband or wife, but give it to your children, give it to a good friend, give it to someone who you think will outlive you. And it is important because if the person whom you give is very emotional, then it is not going to be very useful. So these are things that you want to state clearly. My choice is near my end of life, most important of all to me when you're thinking about the last days or last hour, what do you want? Pick what is it you want. Most people will want to die at home. I don't want to die in a hospital with tubes stuck here and there. I want to be at home. I want to maintain my dignity. I don't want to be on a ventilator. All right, I did not take this because I think it is ridiculous to insist that everything be done. No, not necessary. So you think which is appropriate. In terms of living through serious illness and the ending of life, what do you mean by quality of life? Because most people will say that if my life quality is so poor, then please let me go. So again, it's the same thing about the state of your mind. Are you able to make decisions? Are you comatose or are you not? Are you able to be rational, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is very important. If I could choose where I would be when I'm dying, please, what is your choice? I would put at home. Some people, and I shared this in Singapore some years ago at a conference, a public conference, and one of the Singaporean brothers raised their hand and said, no, 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 I want to die in a hospice. I do not want to die at home. So I was puzzled. And so I asked, why, brother, do you say you do not want to die at home when for most people, home will be the most comfortable, most familiar, and we would all like to go in a familiar environment. And the Singapore brother say, no, 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 no. I can't die in my HDB flat. I have to die in a hospice because if I die in a HDB flat, its resale value will go down. Okay, very practical, I must admit. I didn't think about that, but I will leave it to you to make your individual decision. Then with regards to life sustaining, you want resuscitation? I would say do not resuscitate, please. All right. What will you have in each situation here? If you can recover, I would say, of course, use. If there is a terminal illness, please don't use. Please don't bankrupt the family with a futile process of prolonging the dying stage. Remember I shared earlier, dying is a process. Death is an event. There is no point in prolonging the dying stage and making everybody suffer. We as doctors prolong life. We do not prolong the dying process. If the brain function is gone, please forget it. If I'm demented, please forget it. 
What are the things that are important to you? Well, take it. I want my favorite Buddha image. I want to be pain free, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, who do you want to be among you? I want my Kayana meters. I want my family. All right. Please, I don't want any deathbed conversion. Huh? Please keep away the deathbed evangelists away from me. My Kayana meters, please lock the door. Don't let them come in. I cannot possibly at the last moment suddenly change. Okay. Do your loved one know your wishes? I would say give it to your children. Have you spoken to your doctor? Yes, I've got a doctor friend too that I've informed. Do that is your venerable aware? Unfortunately, our venerables are very mobile. So unfortunately, it's a bit difficult here. Well, if you're a member of Subang Jaya, you're a member of Sakya Inn. Well, please write it down. I'm a life member of Subang Jaya. I'm a life member of Sakya Inn. I'm a life member of Metal Lodge. Wow, should be very safe. Huh? All right. So to help attend to my need, call who? Call my Kayana meters. Okay. When I'm dying, how would I like my surroundings to be? I want my favorite suttas to be played on the CD or on the recorder. I want my favorite hymns. I don't want this Kayana Mita to sing. His voice is horrible. You probably wake me up or something. But what I mean is to specify it. And then when you're at the near of your life, who would you want to be informed? Inform my lawyer, please. Okay, etc. etc. And following my death, who do you want to inform? Again, who are the kayanamitas you trust that can help you because your spouse will be too distressed? Have you written your obituary? I would strongly suggest you do. Now, important question. Do you want to be embalmed? I would say no, not for me, because I know the embalming process. Do you want to be buried or cremation? My wife and I are very green, so we say cremation. And what about memorial service? One night for wake, maybe one night for the another for distant relatives and friends to come to Kopla. All that is for the living, not for the dead. Okay. Other things which are important to you. Okay. What is it? You better write down. Maybe you insist that your favorite clothes must be worn, your favorite suit, your favorite shoe. Well, whatever it is, please write it down. Okay. And then when you've completed, print it in a few copies. Make sure you sign it well, get your friend to sign it well, and make sure you keep it well and safe, not with you, what's the point, but with your Kayana meters and maybe a few copies with your children. And this is the obituary. Let me find the obituary somewhere. Is the obituary. Yes, I even prepared an obituary. My father, when he passed on, I used this. Okay, so put his photo there. You write all this, fill it in. And nowadays, no need to waste money on newspaper. Huh? Hardly anybody read newspaper. Just use the social media and internet to share this obituary. And that is good enough. What I'll do is I'll send the obituary and I'll send the uh, advanced medical directive. By the way, advanced medical directive is legally recognized in Malaysia. I will send it to the organizing committee who can in turn send it to whoever they think within their committee or within their uh, centers would benefit. With that, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, I've reached the last few minutes for Sister Yenli to do the sharing of merits. And I'm very grateful that I have this opportunity to share this in the seventh month. I hope that I have managed to answer the questions which were forwarded to me even before this talk. They're very smart nowadays. They say, you wait for the talk, no chance. So they forward it before the talk, which is good. Then I actually incorporate it into the talk. So I want to thank every one of you. I want to thank the IT committee because they work very hard all the time. Actually, I only prepare my talks. They are the ones, the background people who work very hard organizing the technical details. And of course, Sister Yen Li for coming forward, playing along with us with this seven-month team, golf team, of uh, pretend to fight, pretending to dress in a funny way to frighten you all. And let us take this opportunity to share merits, to dedicate merits, 
to all who would need it. And I will let Sister Yen Lee take over from now. Sister, over to you.